Yeah. Okay, well, Paul's been here a couple of times before, and we've always found him a very valuable speaker. Uh, he is uh, from the Department of Human Services Financial Information Service, and he'll provide for us an overview of pension eligibility and concessions, but with a focus on the upcoming 1 1 2017 asset test changes. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. The manual way. <laughs> so, yes, good, good morning. Um, I'm Paul Flame, based at the Oakley, what used to be called Centrelink, and now we're Department of Human Services because uh -huh. uh, we've joined forces with several other Commonwealth departments, the main one being uh, Medicare. Um, and today I'm uh, talking about the January 17 changes to the pension, um, which has gone through Parliament and all set to go. This was in the previous budget, um, so it's all been passed and received royal assent. So we're 99.99% .99 certain that it's going to uh, take effect. Um, compared to the super rules, which was the last budget, and that's um, all working out again. It's all still up in the air, the, the Super Rules, because as you probably know, yeah, there's a lot of political discussion, I think, still to come, and, uh, and to see what will happen there in regards to whether it'll get through Parliament unmodified or modified or not at all. But these rules are certainly have been passed. Um, I've got, besides what I've handed out, which is the copies of the presentation today, I've got a bit of a um, handout about the job I do, the Financial Information Service, the current rates charts, and the very useful um, snapshot, one-page snapshot of all the concessions that we provide. So very quickly, the job I do, the Financial Information Service, it's, um, the reason it's got such a long title is they want to put the word information in to uh, differentiate us from financial planners. <laughs> So we only provide information education. Uh, we can't give advice or, or recommendations. So our really role is to help people, and it's a free service available to everyone. So whether you're on the, a Centrelink payment or Centrelink concession, or never going to be on a payment, it's still available to everyone to access. It's a free service. Um, and our role is to educate and inform people on two main areas. One, all the, the Centrelink payments and concessions to explain how their situation might relate to those and, and explain their current eligibility and their future eligibility. And the second part is to provide information and education about all the different financial decisions in life. Um, one of our biggest focuses is explaining all the superannuation rules, um, all the choices there um, whilst you're working and the salary sacrifice and so on. But also we focus a lot on when people get to the retirement age and looking at the account-based allocated pension income streams, those choices. We talk around the areas of the impact of um, if you're downsizing your home. Um, that can have a huge impact on your situation. Um, so we provide an education service about um, financial decisions um, to help people understand their choices. We explain also the tax implications. So, unfortunately, everything's pretty complicated. So there's the tax rules, which one set of rules, and the super rules, which is another set of rules, and the Centrelink rules, which is a, a different rules. And they, they're not all the same, and they can be quite different. Um, another area we uh, help people on, and it's a very complex area, um, and, and, and I'm happy to come at another time if it's relevant, to this group is aged care. Um, so we explain the processes of aged care um, and, and the possible fees and charges around that and the different choices whether you pay a lump sum or, or you pay extra fees per month instead of in lieu of a lump sum. What do you do with your home? Does the home have to be sold? That's a service we provide. So you can contact us and speak to us on the phone by phone for a short call 
or you can book in and come and see us one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, so we're available at every Centrelink office, so my colleague, colleagues at Cheltenham, I'm at Oakley. Um, the only issue is that because there's only one of us in each office, we do get booked out pretty quickly, so we'll book three or four weeks ahead. So yes, we give advice, uh, completely wrong, we give information and not provide advice, so we're not a financial planners, we can't give recommendations or directions. So um, today I want to touch upon the big, some big changes, some very major changes um, uh, that, that, that's going to have a, a huge effect and especially um, in our areas that we cover, um, there's a lot of people that are going to be impacted by this. Um, the figures are as close as we can get to it. Um, one figure that we don't know, which impacts directly on the cut-off limits and so on from 1st of January, is the rate of pension at the 1st of January. Because the, the pension does get adjusted with cost of living, and it will be increased from what it is today to what we're not sure. So these, some of the figures we're talking about here, um, are providing with um, estimates um, as close as we can. So the basic requirement for age pension um, is you have to be age pension age and, and that's slowly being increased um, and they're doing that by um, having different segments. Uh, younger people have to be older before they can get age pension age. And so these are all locked in now. Um, so the blue, the very light blue, um, affects both male and females. So um, the top light blue, if you're born between 52 and, and December 53, both male and females have to be 65 and a half years of age before they can get a pension. Um, if you're born after January 57, you have to be 67 years of age. And that's the highest at the moment. If you're born earlier, your age pension age could well be less. <coughs> Now, that's the, the current maximum age at the present age, pension 67. There was um, talk and possible legislation prepared to increase it to 70. Um, that's been withdrawn. I'm not sure if it's been entirely ripped up, but it's, it's not on the, on the table at, at, at present. Um, so 67 is the official maximum age if you're born after January 57. These are the current maximum rates of, of pension. Um, single person, 873.90. Um, couple, 658.70 each a fortnight. And your couple, whether you're married uh, or de facto, um, and importantly, you always get the couple rate even if your partner's too young to claim the pension. So if I'm age pension age and my wife is not age pension age, the maximum I still can get is a couple rate, 658.70. If we're both age pension age, we potentially can both get 658.70. The other very important point about couples, and we're going to come to our incomes test and assets test, um, it's always a combined assessment. So regardless of who's got what, 50-50 or my wife's got everything, I've got nothing, it still equally affects our potential eligibility for, for payments and concessions. It's always a combined assessment. The only exception to that is superannuation sitting in the accumulation phase if it's in the person's name who's under age pension age. Then that's one of the few things we don't count. So superannuation in a person's name who's under age pension age still in the accumulation phase, it's not counted. But once you start drawing down on it, or once you reach age pension age, it certainly does get counted. Now within these rates, the full rates of 873.90 and 658.70, there's different components, um, base pension, pension supplement, energy supplement. Um, and this does have importance because um, there's one change that's mooted a, a foot to, now the energy supplement was introduced for, we were never supposed to use the term, but carb, the carbon tax, which never actually got off the ground. 
So they want to take away um, the energy supplement from new people from the 20th of September. So they've got this term grandfathered or saved, and what that term is that if you're already receiving a payment or concession, and they, in the new legislation, they make it grandfathered or saved, that means the new legislation will not affect those people already in place with the payments or the concessions. And not everything is grandfathered. This one is grandfathered, so the, the um, plan is, but time is fast running out, so whether this will get introduced, because this de depends on legislation, is that anybody granted pension after the 20th of September will not receive the energy supplement. They'll get less. So at the moment, within that rate we were just looking at, there's a $14.10 energy supplement for a single person, um, or $10.60 in the, in the couple's rate. So for new people after the 20th of September, if this legislation gets through, so there's ifs around this, there'll be people on different rates, there'll be two different rates of maximum pension. There'll be the old rate, which you're already enjoying now if you're on a pension, but if you grant it after this goes through, you won't be getting that energy supplement. Um, that in also includes, because the Commonwealth sees healthcare card, you, you get that payment each quarter, and then they're wanting to remove that too uh, for new people granted that what if, card. What if you are on pension, yes. and you come off one of the little seniors' cards, so we'll, we'll, do they we'll, cut you because We'll, we'll talk about it, we'll come into that, because that's a very important point. Uh, we'll come to that, yes. So, quickly, um, there's an income and assets test that will work out your, your pension. And it's a Centrelink's way of defining um, income and Centrelink's way of deciding assets. And the key to this is we get two separate tests which we simultaneously apply to your situation, but separately. And whichever test pays you the less pension, or one test makes you ineligible, that's the one we use. So if I've got no income, I could get back some pension on the incomes test, but I've got a $2 million vacant block of land, I can't get a pension because the, I've got too many assets. So income test, asset test, whichever test pays the less, it's the one that we use. And it's always your situation, what is your situation today? And if your situation changes, you tell us, and we reassess both the income and assets test to see where you stand. So income, you can have a certain amount of income from all sources, that's income from investments, income from work, income from self-employment, income from investment properties, you can have a certain amount of income before it starts to reduce your pension. So for a single person, you can have up to $164 a fortnight. We always work on fortnights. Um, you can have $160 a fortnight of income from all other sources before it starts to reduce your pension. Yes? Can I just ask, is yep. the income your tax, taxable income? No, it's Centrelink's way of working out income. And we'll just, we'll break that down in a moment. Yeah. So it's quite different from taxed income. Um, so you can have up to 164. Every dollar over that, it starts to eat into your pension by the rate of 50 cents in a dollar. Um, till if your assessed income is over $1,912 um, a fortnight, or nearly 50,000 a year for a single person, that's a cutoff point with too much income to get a pension. In between those, you'd be getting a part pension. As I said earlier, couples, it's always a combined assessment. So if my wife is working her gross income before tax, before any salary sacrifice is counted, um, and, and income from our investments, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so it's a combined income. Once that combined income goes over 292 a fortnight, the pension starts to go down. If we're both on a pension, every dollar, we lose 50 cents from our combined pension, or 25 cents each from each of our pensions. So over 292 every dollar we lose 50 cents combined until we reach a cutoff of if it's 2,927 a fortnight, 
that's too much income that cuts out our pension, we've got too much income, which annually is just a bit over $76,000 a year. Now, how we assess income? Yes, it's, if you're working, it's gross income before any tax, or before any salary sacrifice. The exception to this, if your age pension, they like for you to work if you want, if you want, and to provide an incentive around that, they've got this what's called a work bonus, and the best way to think of that is as an offset, and it's only for people of age pension age. The first two fifty dollars a fortnight you earn and work, we won't count. It's a work bonus, work offset. It's also cumulative if not used. So every fortnight you're on a pension, you don't work. That bonus increases two fifty unused, two fifty fortnight. It just keeps building up. If you don't work for a year, your work bonus will reach its maximum credit of six thousand five hundred a year. No. The whole year, the credit will be six thousand five hundred, which means that you can earn up to that amount before it would um, affect your payment. That would cancel out your earnings. You still have to tell us your earnings, so we can apply that offset. But that's the offset, and and people see that on their letters, work bonus six thousand five hundred. So they come in and want us to pay them the six thousand five hundred, <laughs> and we have to explain it's only an offset available to cancel out earned income. And it's only to do with employment income. If you've got an overseas pension, we transfer that uh, into Australian uh, uh, currency, and that's income straight against your pension. If you've got a fortnightly super pension, so the old-fashioned fortnightly from big companies or um, the public service, or fortnightly, you haven't got a lump sum, but you're getting a fortnightly lifetime pension, that's income. We might have a component that we don't count, called a deductible amount, and there has been a change around that. The most we will not count is 10%. We used to, it used to be uncapped, so we used to deduct a lot of it, but now the most we will deduct is 10% of the gross. You may or may not have a deductible amount. You have to get those details from your super company. We'll come back to the income streams in a moment, the allocated. Pensions. Um, if you've got an investment property, we assess rental income minus expenses. So the, the expenses of maintaining that property, and if there's a loan against that property, the interest is a further deduction. Um, but we're not as generous as uh, tax. We go to zero. If your expenses exceed your rental, we will just assess no rental. We don't do negative gearing of offsetting income against other sources. If you're self-employed, um, the net income, we allow most deductions are tax allow, and so we look at the net income after expenses you from your self-employment. Now, most investments, um, we group together under the term financial investments, and that includes allocated pensions. So if you're starting on a pension now, um, or starting a new income stream now, that gets captured in within this financial investments. So how we assess income from the great majority of investments, um, savings, term deposits, shares, income streams, new income streams, instead of looking at the actual interest you earn or dividends, instead of looking at what you draw down, we just add all of those investments that you have together to get one current lump sum and then just apply, apply an artificial interest rate against it an artificial set interest rate called DMI. And this is why it's different from tax, because tax looks at the actual income you get, whereas we apply this artificial flat uh, interest rate called DMI, set by the government. And these are the DMI rates at present. It's two-tiered. So of your savings, shares, term deposits, if you've got a $200,000 allocated pension you've started, we add those all together. And the first 49,200 as a single person, we assess that you're earning 1.75%. Now that's irregardless of what you're actually earning. Your investments might be bringing you 10%, 0%, negative 5%, but this is what we apply for pension purposes, this artificial deeming rate. The first 49,200 
1.75%, and the rest at 3.25%. Is, is that likely to change with the drop in well, bank rates? So whenever I explain this, yeah, everybody sees all 3.25 and they're most unhappy about it. So it's at the government, I'm not sure. It's at the government's discretion. They don't change it very often. Historically, the higher level was, um, it mirrored the term deposit rates, but now term deposit rates are below that. So, with the cameras on me, um, I, I'm not sure. I can hope that the, the government will consider dropping it, um, but it's up to their decision, and it would cost them money if they drop the interest, if they drop that interest rate, because people get a bit more pension in certain areas. Does that require legislation or does it No, it doesn't. No, they can change it at any time. My understanding. Does the department have the discretion to. Not the department, no. Not the department. Because that would, that would cost serious money if we change the deeming rates. Who is the treasurer? Don't know who it lands with, but it would be, it would be yeah, the government. I'm not sure who, who's uh, personally responsible or whether it's a group decision. So couples, the deeming rates combined, the first 81,600 at 1.75%, the rest at 3.25%. Now, if you were on a pension um, and started the, had an income stream already in place, your income stream could be grandfathered, which means that the way we work out income is different from this. It's a different method, which focuses on what you draw down, and if you're drawing down near the minimum, we assess very little income for those income streams, grandfather income streams. So for all new income streams now, it's captured by this for the income test. And the, the capital I referred to there is at the end of As the financial year? No, no, today. So everything's, what is your situation today? And that's what we assess it on. If yeah, it changes, like you, yes, yes. <laughs> if you change it, um, yeah. you can tell us and we'll update it. So for shares, um, how it works is, if you're on a pension, um, there's an automatic update in March and September. So everybody's share prices are updated at that point, March and September. Between those dates, in the background, our mainframe is getting updated about every two weeks with the share prices. But we won't touch your record, your pension record, unless you request it. Yeah, and you've got to, you can request it, but you, if we update one, we update them all. So only contact us if the share market's going down, or you'll do yourself a disservice. Um, but that's fine, because that's well within your rights, because we capture it in March and September. The only other time we'd update it is if you change the number of your, your shares. You, yes, certainly please tell us at that point, and at that time it will also refresh all the share prices. So unless, if you don't contact us, we'll update your share prices in March and September. That's just a deeming example which shows we apply this flat interest rate. But we'll skip over that today. So this is the assets test, and this is what's changing. So the income test, that's the income test, and that's not changing um, for the moment. Um, and the, but the big change is to do with the assets. So the asset test, and this is the things you own. Um, the very big asset that we still don't count is the home property. Uh, regardless of its value, as long as it's on one title and um, the surrounding, the curtilage is under two hectares, five acres, then it's an exempt asset. Does it have to be principal residence? Yes. So, Contemporarily leave your home, and we still count as your principal residence, so you can be away up to about 12 months. But yeah, principal residence, yeah. So, again, for the asset test, you can have a certain amount of assets beyond your home, you can have a certain amount of assets beyond your home before it reduces your pension. But after you go over that level, it starts to reduce your pension. Now, non homeowners are renting or don't own the property they're living in, um, they can have a few more assets before it affects their pension because they haven't got that big exemption, which is uh, the home. So this is the current limits. At present, you can have a certain amount of assets, which we'll look at in a moment. Once you go over that, every $1,000 of assets, you lose $1.50. 
That's a current state of play as of today. Now we count just about everything except your home. So cars and contents we count. So even the contents of the house we count, but we only want a fire sale, garage sale value. And cars, we only want the what they would be worth to trade in or sell. So if you're affected by the asset test, it's important to, if you still got the same car, to contact Centrelink and drop the value because the last value you told us about your car will just be sitting there forever unless you tell us. So cars lose value. So if you're going to be affected by the asset test, it's worth contacting and, and, and reviewing those um, values. Bank accounts and investments, it's just the current value. So the current value of your bank balances, term deposits, the current value of your allocated pension, that's an asset. So that goes up and down, but that, that is an asset. You can update that at any time with us. Shares, the current value. If you've got a holiday house or an investment property, it's assessed at what's called reasonable current market value. In the conditions in today, if it was put on the market, what can it reasonably get? Now, they've got lots of teams within Central Lincoln. One of the teams at present is revaluing all these properties. But our valuations are supposed to represent reasonable current market value. So if we have a figure that you think is unreasonable, you certainly have the right to query that, and then they'll do a further more detailed inspection, and they, they may, might change it. Um, it can go either way. Some people say, oh, no, it's not worth anything, and that the land value has huge development value, and we have to maintain it. But other times, yeah, I've seen the examples where we have overvalued it, and that if a person's appealed, we've adjusted it. But what we're all supposed to be striking is reasonable current market value. When you return a bank account, can you offset against that credit card debt? No, no. We don't allow many offsets at all. So credit card debts are your issue, and we can't offset them, unfortunately. So when it says loans there, really means money you have lent, not money yes, you have Yes, so that we count loans. If I've lent my children money, and um, one of the very um, issues that really infuriate people is if you've got a family trust or company, and it might be just a shell, <laughs> but on the books it's showing that it owes you money, we count that as a, a third party owes you money. So um, there are issues. So yeah, loans is you've lent somebody money, um, the only loan we usually allow is if you've got an investment property and you've got the mortgage secured against that investment property, then we do allow that. What, what's the difference in principle? <laughs> so what do you mean? So, oh, so if, you off, if you offset a, yep. a second house loan, yep. but you don't offset a credit card loan, what's the difference in principle? They're the same. It's what well, I think it's just a, a, a decision, a decision they've made at, at some point. Um, yeah, so. Um, so somebody has decided. Yeah. Not, not, not a regulation. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, Paul. Yes. Uh, you brushed over it pretty quickly, I guess. Yes. Investments include DIY super funds. Yeah. Because a lot of us have those. Okay. Things. So, well, yeah, sorry. Um, what the only investment that's not counted is money sitting in super in the accumulation phase in a person's name who's underage pension age. Otherwise, it's all counted these days. All counted. So it's still in the accumulation phase that's counted as an asset. In an income stream phase, it's counted as an asset. When the value of your pension fund goes down, you can tell us and we can um, update it. Yeah. Now we so um, can't you adjust that on, online because we haven't got bring to, up on the telephone yeah. and get it changed. Yeah, we haven't got to that. They're adding more and more things um, for online, but they haven't got to the point of being able to update your self made super fund online yet. No, um, especially if you're in the income stream phase um, mm -hmm. for a self managed fund or a commercial fund, we do send out. This is one of the. Most, 99% of the things we depend on you to tell us. So people think that we know exactly what people have got in the bank and what they're doing. 
We don't. We depend on people to keep us up to date. So if those changes occur, to tell us. And there's no, there's not many reviews sent out these days. So it's if you don't tell us, things won't be changed. It's very important to keep us updated. One of the few exceptions to that is we do still send out reviews tw twice a year for income streams. So if you started an allocated pension income stream, we do send out a review asking what the balance is for those. Um, but that's one of the few exceptions, yeah. Well, um, if you didn't comment on that. Um, no, so you can gift as much money as you want, um, but if you go over the limits, it's held against you. And the limits is $10,000. The primary rule is no more than $10,000 in one financial year. So the year is a financial year. No more than 10 in one financial year. And that's the same whether you're single or couple. Couple don't, don't get 20, it's still 10 in total. And that's where it, whether it's friends, family, charities, no matter how well intentioned it is, it's still seen as a gift. So no, no more than 10 in one financial year. The second rule is no more than 30 over a rolling five year period. Rolling five year period. Which is, yeah, the quickest you could do it, because the primary rule is no more than 10 in one financial year. You could three separate financial years in a row, you could give away 10, and then you'd have to give it a break for two years. Um, if you give away more than that, let's say you give away 100,000 in one year, 10,000 is okay, that's within the limit, but 90,000 is too much. That 90,000 is held against you, so you've still got it for five years. And so it's included, as though you've still got that 90, included with what you've still got, and those two together are used to work out what your entitlement is. And so we count it as an asset, and we also deem it for the incomes test. So, um, it's held against you for five years. It doesn't reduce over that time, locked in. After five years, it's taken off. And there is a question on the claim form saying, have you gifted anything in the last five years before claiming the pension? Because you're still captured by the gifting rules. Um, outside of five years, no, because it's outside of the, the, the gifting rules. But five years, we hold it. How much investigation goes on? <laughs> well, I we do rely on. I hear a lot of people who've yeah. got a lot of assets yeah. who say they're getting a pension. Yeah. If there, if there's all I sorts of rules. I mean, they are increasing the levels of checks, and there's a lot of people getting caught. They're doing checks with the tax department, they're doing checks with the titles office. There's some rules that you can do things that are remarkably generous compared to other things, like. I can give away my house. It's very specific rules, but I can give away my house, but as long as there's an agreement that I can live there for life, that seems okay, because it fits into one compartment. Also, hmm, there's all, yeah, there's some, sometimes people think, oh, these people are cheating, but they're actually um, not, but others might be, and we hopefully catch them. The 30k rule is on a, in any five year period, you can't give more than 30,000. The primary rule is no more than 10 in one year. Over a rolling five year period, no more than 30. What about the three year period? There's no three year period. Oh, it's 50k. There's no 50k. No more than 10 in one financial year. Yeah. No more than 30 over any rolling five year period. Now that's gifting. There's no limit on you spending money on you or your partner. And so this is what people talk when we're about to get to the very unpopular rule change that's occurring. People talk about going on a massive spending spree. Um, there is no limit on you spending money on your, you, yourself or your partner. So whether that's travel, whether that's into the home because the home is an exempt asset so if you're renovating a home or improving a home that's not counted um, but I always say I mean yes it's not enjoyable if the pension is reduced but you've got to take a step back and look at what's best for yourself to spend lots and lots of money to get a smaller amount of pension does that financially matter for you how long have we got in time Peter? 
Probably only about 10. Okay. So let's get to it. There's only a few things that are not counted as um, assets. So the home, as we've mentioned, um, if, you're, if some, you or your partner goes into a, um, aged care, you pay what used to be called an accommodation bond, now it's called a refundable accommodation deposit, <coughs> that's not counted for Centrelink purposes. Um, if you want to plan ahead and pay for your funeral, that's not counted. Um, the only other exception is a special disability trust, and this is a very specific, very, very specific arrangement that if a family member has got a severe level of disability, other family members can put assets into that trust for their benefit, and it won't be seen as a gift, and it won't be held against the person with a disability. <coughs> if that's relevant to you, I strongly recommend you to talk to a financial information officer in person, <coughs> because there's lots of rules and restrictions around that for, for that to be accepted. Does that just apply to the current, the, the current family or the grandparents as well? Um, I think it can be grandparents. Uh, I can't remember. This yeah, she's a direct family. It might be the grandparents, but I'd have to check that point, so I'm not sure. So this is the current asset limits. Um, a single homeowner can have up to $209,000 before your uh, pension is reduced. Every thousand dollars over that reduces your pension by $1.50. Until currently, mm -hmm. if you're a single homeowner, your assets beyond your home are over $791,750. That's the point where the pension cuts off. Couple homeowner, today, beyond your home, you can have up to $296,500 of assets. This is my pointer. Um, before your pension is reduced, every thousand dollars over that, um, the pension starts to reduce. Thousand dollars, you lose a dollar fifty as a couple, until the cutoff, one million one hundred seventy-five thousand. So, if your assets are just under that, you'd be getting a very small pension at present. Um, and as long as you get any pension, you get the full concession card. So, to the change. And this has been passed and everything, as I said, and this is not grandfathered. This is not saved. So it's going to affect anybody that falls within these limits. Even if you're on a pension, it's going to affect people. So there's a good bit and there's a bad bit. Um, the good bit is they're increasing these amounts so you can have a bit more assets before your pension starts to reduce. So they're increasing that threshold of assets before your um, uh, pension starts to reduce by the asset test. But the bad bit is once you go over it, the rate that it eats into your pension is doubled. So at present, every thousand dollars over the limit, you lose a dollar fifty. Once you go over the new limits, every thousand dollars you lose three dollars. So at the moment it slowly goes down till we get to the cutoff. Whereas under the new regime you can have a bit more assets, but then it goes down much steeper. Um, so there's two main effects impacts of that. The cutoff rates are being dropped down where the, there's no eligibility, quite quite a deal. And also the people who still fall within the cutoff rates, but are at the higher end will find that they get less pension. But is, is this indexed? Yes, it gets adjusted and gets indexed, um, but these are the, these are the, this is what's the, getting really set. So there's no change in the cutout point? Yes, there is a, a huge change in the cutout point. Um, now... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So the cutoff point at present for a single homeowner is seven ninety one seven fifty five forty one five hundred. Now it's going to be a bit higher than that. There's an asterisk. What we, as I said earlier, we don't know what the rate of pension is going to be. So this is based on today's figures. So the cutoff points are going to be a bit higher. With our guesstimates, we think the cutoff rate for single homeowners is going to be around the five forty seven mark. 
couple homeowner. Now, see, so the thresholds are lower on the current amount. They're jumping up a bit. So, two, if you can have a bit more assets before the pension reduces, a couple now can, from the 1st of January, can have 375 assets before their pension reduces, compared to it was 296,500 before their pension reduces. So the people at the lower end could actually have their pension increased because of this increase in the free area. But once you go over um, those new limits, every thousand dollars will eat into your pension three dollars a, a, a fortnight. So a couple homeowner will be able to have a, up to assets of three seventy-five thousand beyond their home. But over that, every $1,000 I'll lose $3 a fortnight. Well, haven't they reduced the single? Haven't they reduced the threshold? All of these areas have been increased a bit, but the reduction is steeper, and therefore the cutoff limit is lower. So we estimate the cutoff limit is going to be around the 823, $825,000 mark for a couple, compared to. 1,175,000. So people falling between 823 and the current limit unfortunately go to lose their pension. Lose them? Mm. Yeah. They're already on them. So if you're, yeah, if you're over the new cutoff limit, you're going to lose your pension. Now if you lose the pension, um, yeah, you're going to be issued for life two concession cards, which is almost as good as the pension card. So you get the Commonwealth Seniors Health Care card and what's called a low income health care card. It will give you all the same concessions you're enjoying today on a pension card, with the exception you don't get discounted council rates and you don't get as good concession on car registration. So, yes, we always go back to this income test and asset test, and whichever pays um, the less is the one we use. So, you might be asset tested, um, but find yourself under the new rules over the, the new cutoff, the lowered cutoff limits, then unfortunately you will be one of the people that's losing the pension and getting automatically issued these cards for life. Or you might be under the cutoff limits, but you could have your in, um, pension quite dramatically reduced. If you're at the lower end, you might be one of the winners where your pension gets a bit more because the lower end, you can have a few more assets before your pension is reduced. How are we going with time, Peter? Probably five minutes. So as I said, you get automatic if you lose a pension, you automatically get these concession cards, which together are almost as good as a pension card. This chart is not exact again because it's but but it's trying to give you an idea of the dynamics of um, how people are going to be affected. So a single homeowner with two fifty thousand assets at present is getting eight twelve forty. Because they're increasing the free area of how many assets you can have, this lower end person will actually get an increase from the 1st of January. Their pension is going to go up to 873.90. 300,000, now we can see eating into them. So a single homeowner has 300,000 assets, they're getting 73,740 now. Their pension under the new regime is going to drop down to 7. 2390. 500,000 as a single homeowner, we can see a big difference. So 500,000 at present, they're getting 437.40 a fortnight in pension. Their pension is going to drop down to 123.90. So they're going to keep the pension, but there's going to be real reduction in the income that they're going to get from us until we get to the cutoff limit. So then. These people are going to have to look to their investments or their income to make up for that income loss. We've got a similar chart for uh, partnered homeowners. 
So currently, if you've got 300,000 of assets, you'll be getting a slightly reduced pension. Under the 1st of January, you'll get the full pension. Even if you've got 400,000 of assets, you'll be better off under the new rules.